Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Serpente Sunday for Sunday, January 31st, 2021. I am Lori with Behavior Education at Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary. Viewers did a poll and said that for this week's episode of Serpente Sunday, they would like us to focus on a particular species of snake. So I chose Heterodon nasicus. That is the Plains Hognose Snake. We have one of those here at our facility and her name is Hazel. So the Plains Hognose Snake is in the kingdom Animalia, the phylum Chordata. Those are also shared by humans. The class Reptilia, which is all reptiles. And then the order Squamata, and that order is all of the snakes and lizards. And the suborder Serpentes, which is just snakes. The family Colubridae, which is a huge family of snakes. And it's also going to include commonly kept snakes, like um, not just hognose snakes, but bull snakes, gopher snakes, corn snakes, any rat snakes. Those are all in the family Colubridae. The genus is Heterodon. And then the species is Heterodon nasicus. Common names for the Plains hognose snake or Heterodon nasicus took me by surprise when I started looking these up. I have never heard of some of these, but let's go over them. The blow snake, bluffer, faux viper, Plains hognose snake, which is to the best of my knowledge, what the accepted common name is presently. The prairie hognose snake, Spoonbill snake, spreadhead snake, Texas hognose snake, Texas rooter, and the western hognose snake. I always. So, locations that these snakes are found in are all the way from southern Canada throughout the United States, um, but the range in the United States does have eastern and western borders, which are uh, Colorado and Wyoming to the west and Illinois to the east. And then their range goes all the way down into northern Mexico. They really prefer sandy, loose soil biotypes. And they can be found in elevations up to 8,200 feet or 2,500 meters. We are just east of Colorado Springs. And so our hognose snake, Hazel, lives here with us at about 5,200 to 6,000 feet. They are found in a wide variety of different habitat types like prairies, floodplains, grasslands, semi-deserts, semi-agricultural areas, rocky areas, and some coastal areas. I'm not surprised by that either because Hazel spends a fair amount of time in her damp sphagnum moss and in her water dish. Natural behaviors that these snakes are going to exhibit in the wild are that they are typically diurnal, which means they are most active during the day. However, as with any species that can change if they're trying to increase their opportunity to find prey or depending on the seasons and weather. They're generally docile even when you find them in the wild and typically don't bite as one of their defense mechanisms. Defense behaviors do include neck flattening, bluff strikes, puffing up, and death feigning. Hognose snakes are famous for pretending to be dead. And a colleague of mine who does some field research just south of here in Pueblo, Colorado, and finds Plains hognose snakes in the wild, says that she has seen them doing this feigning death behavior. So their diet in the wild includes amphibians, and small lizards with the occasional small rodent. But they do brumate underground during the winter. They're oviparous, which means that they're egg layers. And they are currently classified as least concerned by the IUCN, and that's an international organization. And this is due in part to local conservation efforts to protect this species in their native habitats. All right, their behavior in captivity is going to again be generally docile. They're typically maintained in terrestrial setups with very deep substrate because they like to burrow. They will display novel behaviors in captivity. And I see our Western hognose snake doing things like climbing, swimming, using humid hides, and they can learn to eat small mammals and fish. So Hazel occasionally will eat fish and she does regularly eat small mice. I have not been able to get her to eat any rats like fuzzy rats, or pinky rats or anything like that, but she will eat mice. Remember that their diet in the wild is gonna be amphibians, and so sometimes it can be challenging to get them to eat, especially as babies, um, under captive management until they get used to eating 
uh, the small rodents. They may not eat for two or three months, starting around December or January and going through February to March. And they're also gonna exhibit reduced activity during that time. And I don't worry if I don't see Hazel for weeks at a time during the winter, and I don't worry if she doesn't eat for weeks at a time during the winter, because this seems to be just a normal occurrence with them. And it very well may be related to the fact that they brumate in the wild in the winter, and that this is just a way that they're exhibiting a similar behavior, even though they're under captive management. And I guarantee it does not get below freezing in my house generally doesn't get below 70 degrees in any room in my house because I get cold very easily and I tend to keep the house closer to 78 to 80 degrees. But she still, despite that I keep the house warm, she still will have reduced activity and go off food for a few months during the winter. Notable characteristics of heterodon nasicus are that they have keeled scales and that means there is a protruding ridge in the center of each one of their scales that makes them feel rough when you touch them. They have a flat upturned nose that kind of looks like it's squished in and you'll see that soon because I'm going to show you videos of our hognose snake hazel doing some various activities here. They do have posterior maxillary teeth which are enlarged and grooved. You will sometimes hear these referred to rear fangs but I don't believe they are technically fangs because they do not inject venom. There is a duverinoid gland present, which does secrete toxins. And these toxins are specific to the natural prey that they would eat in the wild. So the toxins that are produced or secreted by the duverinoid gland have evolved to affect species of frogs and toads. Now let's talk briefly about hognose bites to humans. The most recent information I found was from a paper by Brandehoff et al. that was published in 2019. And basically hognose bites are not considered medically significant. They generally cause local swelling, pain, and irritation if they affect the bitten person at all. There have been no reported cases of systemic toxicity and only one reported case of hematologic toxicity and that caused thrombocytopenia, which is a reduced platelet count. And that is the specific case that this Brandehoff paper highlighted. I'm not going to go over care and captivity because my area of specialty is behavior and training. And that's really what I want to focus on. I really want you to go to Reptifiles. I think that is a great start. I know that Mariah Healy, who runs Reptifiles, puts a lot of time and effort into their care guides. She tries to be as scientifically accurate as she can be based on current research and accepted best practices. So if you go to Reptifiles.com and you look up hognose snakes, or heterodon nasicus, you're going to get this list of options. So please go there if you want to learn more about the ins and outs of keeping a hognose snake yourself. I'm going to briefly talk about heterodon nasicus in Colorado because that is where we live and that's where our hognose snake hazel lives. The plains hognose snakes are native to Colorado. They are listed as a Colorado native species by the state of Colorado. And according to Colorado Parks and Wildlife, heterodon nasicus is considered non-regulated wildlife. And that means that in this state, they are legal to own, import, and sell, even though they're a native species. So you can collect from the wild, you can own and import them, but you can have only four at a time. And this is to ensure that the wild populations in our state don't become diminished to a point where they are threatened. Let's talk specifically about our hognose snake, Hazel. So Hazel lives here at Behavior Education at Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary. We are just east of Colorado Springs in the state of Colorado in the United States. She was donated to us as an educational program animal. So we were at an event and we ran into another organization that was doing reptile education and Hazel was one of their program animals and she had had an unexpected clutch and they had all of these tiny little baby hognose snakes that they were trying to get feeding and we were talking that we 
about how we do educational outreach here at our animal sanctuary. And it's not all just with horses, but with different species. We really try to educate the local community about all local species of wildlife. So mammals, reptiles, amphibians, including all of the snakes, because we really would like people to live in harmony with them and to learn how to live with native species of wildlife without harming them or displacing them. We just want everybody to coexist. And so they offered us one of the baby hognose snakes. However, before we left for the weekend, they actually ended up offering us Hazel, which was the mother to this unexpected clutch that they had. And of course, I was happy to take the adult hognose over a baby because babies, again, their natural diet is amphibian. It can be difficult to get them to start feeding under human care. And so I was happy to take the adult who already had educational experience, was already habituated to people and human handling, and was already eating uh, small rodents with no problem. So we brought Hazel home here to our animal sanctuary. She arrived on July 21st, 2018. So we've had her about two and a half years at the time that I'm filming this video. We don't know her exact age. But based on talking to the people that previously had her, we are estimating that she was hatched in about 2014, which would make her six going on seven years old. So Hazel's habituated to handling. She also has learned to voluntarily shift out of her enclosure onto stations and into exercise pens when she's given the opportunity. She's engaging in foraging exercises, and I've recently started teaching her target training as well. So Hazel does a lot, but I don't bother Hazel unless she is already awake and active in her enclosure. So if I see that she's awake and active and moving around her enclosure, that's when I will offer her the opportunity to engage in some of these activities or to earn reinforcement through a training exercise. If I don't see Hazel, or even if I do see her, but she's in a cave or she's under the substrate or she's in her humid hide, then I don't bother her because I think that's intrusive and we adhere to the least intrusive principle here at our facility. Now, if Hazel wants out, she has very, very um, clear ways of telling me that she wants out. And one of the things that she will do is climb up on a PVC perch that we have in her habitat and she'll actually coil around it or she'll perch on uh, the PVC or she will go to her glass doors and start pushing on them incessantly. And I can hear that even in another room. So she pushes on the glass so hard that I can hear it um, and it makes a lot of noise. And I'm sure if I didn't have it locked that she would be able to push it open. Her nose has evolved to push things, to push dirt and to dig and to burrow. And so I have no doubt that she would be able to slide her glass doors open if I didn't keep a lock on them. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to now show you several videos of Hazel doing various activities here at our facility. Please feel free to contact me if you have additional questions. You can reach me through behavioreducation.org or by emailing me at behavioreducationllc at gmail.com. Of course, you can always message me on social media via YouTube, Instagram, or Facebook. This is Hazel engaging in a very simple puzzle feeding exercise back in November of 2020. And she had begun to slow down after the summer and fall. And she was being much less active than usual. So I made this exercise extremely simple for her. I just have a frozen thawed rodent in that cup. And I placed it within her living space so that she didn't even have to shift out to engage in the activity. However, she did seem very interested on this particular day in what was going on outside. And I think that had I put a shift station or an activity stand adjacent to her enclosure that she probably would have shifted out onto it. I was just trying to make things simple for her because I noticed that her activity level was starting to reduce. And I think that was due to uh, winter weather settling in. 
Now, this is actually from December, and she was being more active on this day than on that day in November. And so I decided I would pair some frozen thawed pinkies um, with a target to initiate target training with her. And I just went ahead and put the frozen thawed rodents directly onto the target. I'm showing her the target on the tongs, and then I'm going to set it on this rock on this activity stand that she's used to shifting out onto and let her investigate that on her own. Now, this is a recent video from January 2021 where I was going to do a target training session with her. I was getting all set up for it. And by the time I got back with the camera and uh, the frozen thawed prey items, she had already shifted herself out onto this activity station and had begun exploring. So I went ahead and paired the target with a food reinforcer because I'm just trying to establish with her that the target means food. Again, I, I didn't start target training her immediately when we got her in 2018. So this is a new activity for her. She's done lots of shifting in and out of her enclosure and lots of puzzle feeding and foraging exercises, but not any target training until just the last few months. So she kind of ignored that activity in the beginning. And then a few minutes later, after she had gone back into her enclosure, she became curious and she turned around to come back out. So uh, she starts to come back out of her enclosure. And I thought that she was going to engage with the target, but she didn't. So I picked the target up and prompted some additional behavior from her by moving the target and that made her pay a little bit closer attention to it and with all of that tongue flicking and the rodent so close to her I think that she smelled it because now she goes for it and this is a typical feeding behavior of this species where they grab the food from the side instead of directly from the front or the back and then they'll chew and work the rodent um, into their mouth from one end or the other. And it's not unusual for Hazel to eat the rodents backwards. And that's what she's doing here. So she has grabbed the rodent from the side and then slowly worked it around in her mouth until she gets it um, from the back end. And this is her second repetition on the same day. And she was just resting on the target disc, so I just tossed the rodent to her. And the rodent basically being in her face, along with the motion of the rodent being flung onto the target, um, stimulated her to go for it. And again, she grabbed it from the side, and then she works it into her mouth so that it's in on end on end. And I think this time she did actually eat it nose first. Now, this is just a bonus video of Cessna. She is our gray banded king snake, and she lives right below Hazel. And so whenever I'm doing activities with Hazel, it seems to be the case that Cessna will wake up and become interested in what's going on. And so I just engaged her in a simple target training exercise on that same day in January that I was working on the target training with Hazel.